Hello, to our webinar. Sorry that I'm unable to be with you. I think, however, it's an important occasion. It obviously marks the launch of the book that any of us worked on. And I think the book is important as a tribute and as a record of what we went through during the pandemic as individuals, as professionals, as university people, and th across the sector. I think the, uh, the webinar and the book are also important because they provide another opportunity to reflect further on what has happened since the writing and the editing and to consider what might happen next. Um, will there, for example, be some new normal and what might it look like? And how do others see it, um, both amongst the uh, contributors, the editors, and amongst the participants of the webinar now? I hope to watch the recording and catch up on what everyone is saying and thinking um, in the course of the chat. So good luck and over to you, everyone. So that was a very warm welcome Hello. and we're going to hand over to Matt now. Matt, your mic's um, still off. Of course it is, of course it is, like I haven't been doing this for the last two years. Uh, brilliant, thanks Marilyn, thank you for setting this up and getting it sorted and um, thanks to John for that little intro. Just very briefly, most of you I guess will understand what the point of the book was, uh, it was to bring together vignettes and experiences and ideas and, and experiences more than anything of people working mainly in, in higher education but one or two in further education um, looking at where we were, what things looked like um, in that that forced shift that we all went through as we were literally forced online when COVID hit and we were locked down. We've had some really fascinating chapters on a whole range of things and a lot of the speakers, the chapter authors are here today to talk to us. Um, let me just briefly share my screen um, because it uh, what I'm showing you now is how you get to the book. Um, so it's here. If you just Google digital learning and higher education, it should pretty much take you straight there. Um, we can cut and paste the, uh, the, the, you know, the email address, the, the address into the, the chat there. What I'm here to tell you is, although it's relatively expensive, um, if you order it between now and the 30th of this month, you can get 50% off. Okay, you need to use the code DIGI50, which is D I G I all caps five zero, but you can get 50% off the price of that book. Um, so obviously, I would encourage you to do that, <clears throat> but uh, that's how you get hold of it. And uh, we are uh, thrilled with it we're thrilled with with what we, we received from our collaborators and our authors there's some really exciting stuff in there and hopefully you'll get a flavor of that over the next hour or so as i have a chat with the various authors about where they are uh what they saw what they experienced and perhaps if we've got time where we think we are now whether we've established a new normal whether things have moved, whether we've regressed back to where we were, or if we're somewhere in between. So that's the plan over the next kind of hour as we go through um, all of those. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen, he says. Um, and the first person I'm going to bring up is Professor Sarah Hayes, who's a colleague from University of Wolverhampton. And then we'll kind of, what we're planning to do is to run through um the chapter authors essentially in order there are one or two missing who can't be here like john for various reasons um but but the majority of our authors are here and then hopefully we'll have time at the end for a q a session where you can ask any of us and the various authors what they've done so uh sarah is up first and uh, she's got a few slides not everybody has but some people have so sarah over to you and uh, talking about post digital policy Oh, thanks so much, Matt, and uh, a little scary to be the first. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, 
mainly these uh, couple of slides are really just to remind me what I wrote about in the uh, the book. And I'd, I'd like to first of all just thank um, Matt and John and everybody enormously for the opportunity to participate in something that's so meaningful and uh, that really gave us a chance to actually do the kind of reflection that John uh, said on um, you know what the the pandemic as this sustained period did in in relation to our working and home lives. And so I called this chapter Pandemics, Policies and Positionality. A bit worrying that I've called it Pandemics because I, I hope we don't have too many more, but you know things look that way. Um, and then I said how COVID-19 makes the case for post-digital policy making in HE. And really by post-digital, I'm talking about this very messy entanglement that we find ourselves in of on, offline, hybrid situations, in life and, and work. And what my chapter was doing really, in a sense, was speculating on some of these challenges that um, the pandemic intermingled with that we already had in higher education, things that I had written about in terms of policy language. I've been, for many years, as uh, having worked in support of learning technology and worked in uh, academic uh, teaching and research, I have had a problem with the way in which we've spoken about the use of, of technology in teaching and in um, learning because we tend to have missed out the, the human element of that and, and all of the human labour that goes into that. So my um, approach to this chapter really was to to some extent to use it as a little bit of a bridge between two books that I wrote one between uh, one before the pandemic and one during the pandemic um, the first one really looking at this idea of policy language that um, you know if you look at it critically and analyze it through a critical discourse analysis you find that it's crediting technologies with human labor agendas buzz phrases phrases but but not necessarily people. So this was where I had, um, you know, approached this this problem before the pandemic, and then um, I had looked at, um, you know, what what does this mean in terms of people and their different contexts during and beyond the pandemic, and I talked about people's post digital positionalities and just how diverse those are. Um, and so the post-digital highlighting this entanglement and access that you may or may not have to all that is digital, the way in which data plays with us, and then individual context through the, the idea of, of positionality. And I think I can just move this on one and say that what I drew upon was a, a colleague who's based in Zagreb, uh, Professor Peter Jandrik, who has worked with a number of us um, on different articles and is the editor of a journal called uh, Post Digital Science and Education. And what Peter did at the start of the pandemic is uh, encourage people to write 500 word testimonies about this thrust of us online at very short notice teach and, uh, and to try to study. And so what you hear, um, what you see before you hear are images, just a few of them that people sent in of their circumstances, family life, pets, and all of the things that, that people um, had going on at, at the same time as, as attempting to teach or learn. And just drawing on this really in the chapter, I wanted to demonstrate that these are the realities, this is what COVID revealed personal intimate narratives shared by our international community and not empty language that seems to stay static within higher education describing uh, what things do rather than people and so just really to to sum up i would say that there's a something of a case here um you know covid19 uh, throwing into relief if you like that not everybody gets to participate in digital living. Uh, there's certainly a lot of inequality and just down the road from us where we're based in the UK in the West Midlands, still a fifth of people not using the internet. So the positionality of people within the, the pandemic and how it intersects with all of the things that go on in um, exclusively of whether they have access or not the ways in which data is drawn on us and forms of digital inclusion. I wanted really to, you know, to make sure that we don't forget this and that we actually think about um, 
you know, there's initiatives around our universities, some of them we've done projects on in relation to digital um, and data and disadvantage. Um, and in universities, we still to seem to be less keen, really, to join up our policies that look at equality, diversity and inclusivity, and those that look at how technology is, uh, you know, said to enhance learning and what we're doing with data, etc. So yes, just to say really that um, we seem to be at this pivotal point where it would be a, an ideal situation if we were to review policy as well as to review how we teach online and how we work in blended environments. And if we don't, I think there is a danger that we can uh, counter some of our, our claims to inclusive practice um, at the policy level. So that's all I had to say really, Matt um about that chapter that's great thank you very much and it is really interesting isn't it how well i found it really interesting that the jump to online had you know so many detractors but actually it opened up the door to some people you know and one of the things that came through really strongly was that some of the more disadvantaged maybe not digitally disadvantaged but some people you know with with specific difficulties and needs have found it easier being online without the need to be physically present to be able to work asynchronously at their own time to watch back so there have been a whole raft of, of, of kind of affordances that this has given us and we've got to capture the, the best ones and not lose you know not just roll straight back or, or keep climbing on without that real understanding of where these these are so thank you for that very much indeed sarah um thanks matt um, brilliant. a real pleasure brilliant i'm going to forge straight on to professor bob harrison uh who's going to give us a, a bit of a view from further education um he's worked in further education for a long time so i'm really looking forward to this so over to bob all right i, I don't know if uh, can you hear me okay yep all grand okay uh, i don't know if, if alison's on the call or, uh, in the webinar because she she might add something to what i'm going to say she can't make it and howard your other collaborator yeah. is in flipping madeira he's off on annual oh, leave i can't believe okay. it all right well i'm in ermston and it's nice and sunny but anyway well the first, first thing i'd like to say uh, is uh, it, it's a bittersweet for me this i mean i i uh, supplied some data and information and views and howard and alison kindly crafted them from a piece of coal into the jewel that is that chapter but what i'd like to say is you know having spent 25 years most of my life and career trying to persuade policymakers politicians head teachers principals governors of the val and teachers of the value of using technology to extend and enhance learning and engage and empower learners it took a, a, a pandemic and the death of you know hundreds of thousands of people and that achieved more in probably six months or a year than I did in the 25 years so it's it's bittersweet for me however I've got a chance now to reflect on what's happened and uh, what just a quick reminder the the, the six key themes of Feltag because this was put in the context of Feltag and post Feltag and what's happened uh, the six key uh, th themes recommendations of Feltag was, you know, does the does the college have a vision for the future, a vision for future learning? Does it have the infrastructure? Does it have learners using their own devices? What about the funding and accountability system, you know, funding particularly, and also accountability, Ofsted and uh, ESFA? Uh, does it have, a, 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 you know, a full program of CPD for staff? And finally, uh, does it engage with employers to make sure that there's some synchronicity between uh, what what students are doing in, in 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 an outside college and what's going on in the workplace? So I think uh, you know I think the pandemic shifted the paradigm very quickly for a lot of people, but for not necessarily the right reasons. And uh, I don't I'd be interested to know what Alice and other practitioners say. I think those colleges that uh, embraced the spirit of Feltag in 2014 and 15 were better placed to cope with and to uh, take advantage of the uh, infrastructure that they built in and the staff. And th those colleges, I think, thrived during it. And 
and those colleges that didn't embrace the spirit probably found it has found it more challenging. So I think the, the pattern Matt, across the sector at the moment, and some really good work by JISC and some really good work by ETF uh, uh, going on. And th across the sector, my view is that it's variable. So some some colleges will revert just straight back, right? Well, they, they found it too challenging. They didn't have the infrastructure. They didn't have the resources. The staff weren't up to speed and everything like that. And I think for those colleges, it'll be very easy just to slip back into the straightforward face-to-face -face and, you know, what, what was the norm. I think those colleges that had invested and followed the Phil Stag spirit will see the opportunities that there are. My, my main fear, this is more to do with, I think, the, the government's policy position is, uh, and it's more, it's certainly reflected more in schools than in colleges. But my main fear is that the investment and the shift in paradigm has been to use technology for teaching and not necessarily technology for learning. And just on a final point, Matt, uh, next week, uh, I'll give a quick plug. It's the uh, e-assessment association uh, uh, conference and uh, presentation of awards and things like that. And I'm the chair of the judging panel for that. And in terms of assessment, I mean, I think there's some fantastic things going on, but I don't think the sector uh, and, and you, can, you can look at you can blame Ofqual for this because, you know, during the fell tag, we challenged Ofqual to say, you know, why, why are you such a strangle or why, why, why aren't you investing in, uh, you know, technology for assessment? And of course, in the private sector, which is where most of those awards are that are at the conference next week, they, they've moved miles on. You know, it's absolutely fantastic what they're doing, but I don't think the sector's caught up yet. And I think uh, that's going to be, you know, the big challenge. So that's a quick run through. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the... Uh, basic stuff I did and a lot of the theorizing Alison and Howard did so I'm not going to comment on that they're the academic they're the academics I, I'm the pragmatic one brilliant I mean there's some really key things there, and I think you're absolutely right and it's not just the FE sector I think it's all sectors some schools are leaping forward some unis are really taking it forward uh, uh, you know and others are just reverting back to type and I think that's absolutely key I'm, I'm really interested in that idea about tech for teacher for teaching as opposed to the tech for learning and really they should be married together shouldn't they and one yeah. of the some of the conclusions in the book are kind of pointing towards policy rather than practice you know almost everyone that's come i guess to this meeting is going to be um thinking about what it means for them in practice but actually it's that level higher about how do we enable that and hopefully maron will speak to that a, a little while later when we look at the association for learner technologists and what they and did uh, for this chapter and i th also think you're absolutely right that this pandemic has brought things a whole load of things forward that perhaps should have been being done anyway yeah uh, and it's it, it the challenge for all of us is to capture the good bits and you know force them to, to be to be kept uh and it's also identifying those and it might be different in different contexts but we've got to we can't just allow it to slip away again you're absolutely right i agree brilliant thank you very much bob that was great um moving on then we've got uh caroline coon uh dr caroline coon for that matter um talking about student agency so uh, a, a whole new point yes thank you so much i don't have slides my intention was to just talk about what i um wrote or with what i was preoccupied at the time it's amazing that we're already at the end of the second academic year after the pandemic but here we are so my my preoccupation has always been with agency and how can we foster agency um it was also the topic of my phd how, how what can we do and how you know how what are the the constraints i think that are always there for students to deal with so in my in my in my chapter um i was preoccupied with a quote that i put in that chapter about a student she said um I find the virtual classroom sessions quite scary and I'm not sure why, but it's just very overwhelming. And that really, she sent me an email and I was saying, wow. Um, and we're talking about young people, 20, 21, 19. Um, and so it really brought to my awareness once again, that emotions are so important. And although um, I have to laugh because while we were reviewing our chapters, Someone said, emotions, really? Do you 
do you really need to talk about them so lit that kind of theoretically and yes because we tend to just not think about the importance of emotions when we do anything in particular when we engage with technology which was what i was thinking about and so what i did really in my how i coped i think with this overwhelmed emotions that students brought to the classroom was to create space that I call a space of care, of presence, solidarity and reciprocity. And I started to do a lot of checking in with emotions. How are you feeling? Is there anything there that, you know, I can hold the space for you? Can we share? Can we um, can we hold each other's space in a way? And so that I felt helped because as Sarah said in her own work, of course, her work is more policy based and I would say she's more at a, at a more general level. But I think that the human element really, really needs to be taken into account because it does make a difference. And emotions are a causal power, as a Margaret Archer would say, and they do make things happen. And they do make things happen in the good sense when you're motivated and you're positive, but they do make things happen in the negative sense, so you would shy away from situations that make you anxious, which was my experience with students doing this online so up. Um, and so this is, yeah, I think mainly my idea. I talked about how I did this and how I putting emotions at the forefront is, I consider, quite valid in, in the pandemic, because I also think it was not only about the technology, it was about so much that all of us faced. Um, you know, family losses, um, problems, economical problems, not having the tools, uh, having to care for people that suddenly fell ill. I think there were so many emotional um, kind of like little nods of emotion that people were pivoting around that they made really studying very difficult. At least that was my experience. Um, and so yeah, what, I think that what do you think like, are the most sorry, what do you think are the most important things that educators can do then to support those emotional needs? I think checking in and acknowledging that the situation is not normal. So for example, during the pandemic, I don't think it helped that we just went in and said, Well, great, let's crack on with our session. I think it helped to say, is everyone okay? Checking in, anyone needs to share anything? Um is there anything you know whatever it is but acknowledging i think that there are emotions that maybe are hindering the engagement however you talk about engagement and so i think asking and connecting with them in a way that feels comfortable for you is for me a key thing and it has worked in my case with my students fantastic so if there was one thing that you'd like to kind of have people take away from you, these little the last five minutes what would what would it be what would be that summing up what 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 you know what's the one thing that you think if you know if, if i ruled the world this is what everyone would need to do um that's a good question well i think is really creating our classrooms as spaces where emotions are welcome not drama i'm not talking about drama i'm not talking about Sometimes people, I think, um, yeah, they think that emotion dramatic moments and it's all really, no, I think emotions are fear, anxiety, joy. So putting those emotions at the forefront of what we do or weaved into what we do is something I would say we need to do that in our classrooms so that the world of studying is a world that is more, I would say, yeah, more doable, less arid, less difficult to engage with, I think. Brilliant, thank you. And it's not always easy, as you know, you, you sometimes face classes of 30, 60, 120 in a room and no one is gonna to want to pour out their emotion. And certainly for us, when we were in the middle of those COVID times and we had bubble groups of eight or 10 students that came in for one afternoon or one morning, there was much, and those groups really bonded because they were able to blurt about their parent, you know. But how do we, you know, and this is a, it's, it's totally rhetorical, but it's what, something for us to think about. How do we retain some of those amazing tutor tutee relationships and allowing space for that emotion 
whilst all the education that has to happen is still still ongoing so yeah uh, well I, th I think the problem is that we that we that we allow ourselves to think that we can just do it without it that i think it's an illusion but you know it's fair enough that yeah but i don't think it can happen we just crack on and we do it but i don't think it is the best scenario for learning to happen that's come how i see it Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. That was really, really useful. And I think that's something that we can all take away about how might we look to 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 do that. Fabulous. Thank you, Caroline. Right. The next chapter is follows on quite neatly because it's Elliot Lancaster and he talks about student perspectives. But unfortunately, he's busy on a project today, so he can't be with us. So although that would have been fascinating, you're going to have to buy the book, I'm afraid, to find out what students think. So um, we're going to jump straight on to Liz. Liz Parcell, who um, works for uh, with JISC and uh, is particularly uh, as a librarian so this is a really really we moved up the the first part was all about that kind of overviews and students and the middle part of the book is about some of those wider perspectives on teaching and learning from people who aren't necessarily uh, stood at the front of classes at the coalface doing the the actual kind of education bit but those that are the vital support networks and we're starting then with, with this Thank you very much, Matt. And uh, actually, Caroline's um, um, words there provide a really nice flow into what I want to say, um, because you talked about emotions and uh, the human dimension, Caroline. And that's exactly where libraries are. They are a bridge between the technology and the human student teacher researcher. So thank you, Caroline, for, for leading into my session um, uh, very nicely there. Um, Matt, I think, I think the first point I'd like to say is that libraries have always adapted to their context and the needs of the community they serve. So now, whether students, teachers or researchers are on campus or online or a blend of the two, libraries are there um, in two places at once, if you like. And the big challenge now is to work towards a more seamless experience for learners and researchers, uh, whether they're engaging online or face to face and, to, and for the library to have a stronger brand online as it has demonstrated that it has got physically during during COVID when people really realised what was missing when they couldn't actually go to the library. And, and, and I think that, you know, libraries are a support service, but they're, they're also at the forefront of learning and teaching. They are in classrooms, they are teaching themselves. So, you know, they're, they're in a lot of places. And I think that's both the huge opportunity and the challenge now to maintain that quality. You're absolutely right. I mean, we always invite our librarians in to, to talk to all students, you know, uh, about how what they can, how they support, what they can offer, what they what they add, rather than just what they do at the side. You know, it's literally what mm. they add to the, the overall experience. You're right. That that seamless experience is one thing, and a lot of that's to do with the tech, but it's also the experience and the expertise of librarians kind of facilitating that. Yeah. How do you build a stronger brand online? How have you well, how have you gone about mm. it over the last few years? Well, I, I, I speak for somebody who observes the library sector rather than actually be, being at, at, at the curl face, if you like. I think like like pretty much everything in the library world, when you're trying to deliver a quality service, a quality experience, it, it starts with the users or the potential users. It's, it's about the conversations that have to take place with those people, whether they are currently um, you know, advocates for the library or whether they've actually never been to the library, finding out what they need, um, doing really good user experience investigations, really good user-centered design. Um, and that's not new for libraries. I mean, people like the Open University, for example, have been doing it for a very long time. But now really is the time for all libraries to be able to develop that really strong online presence um, so that it's not just a, something that's grown incrementally and in a slightly ad hoc way, but it is absolutely part of the whole library brand. And, and this isn't unique to libraries, of course. You know, learning platforms are having to adapt in the same way. And I think there's a lot of common ground to be explored between those looking after the learning platforms and those working on, on the library platforms so that it makes life easier for students and researchers and teachers and not putting barriers in their way because I'm sure that's what it often feels like for users of campus services, that they're, they're having to jump through a few hoops. And, and libraries want to yeah. change that, obviously. I mean, one of the crucial things you said there is not just about supporting students, it's also supporting the staff. Do you want to mm. just say a few words about how, what that has looked like over the last couple of years? Well, I think, I think uh, 
one thing that became fairly obvious, certainly from where I work in, in GIS, where we do a lot of work with the sector around uh, content and discovery of content, is, is that it became um, noticeable to a lot of teachers for the first time that the library actually had a role in delivering digital content. They, they tended to associate the library with print materials because that was what they saw with their own eyes and didn't really realise that the e-books came from somewhere where the library was involved in delivering them. And of course, there was a positive side to that where the e-books were readily available, but there's also a downside where it became very noticeable that a lot of e-books weren't available or they weren't available at an affordable price. And so I think the role of the library in mediating that access, but also working to bring some, some down some of the many barriers that we still have with digital content for teaching and learning. I, th I think that's come to the fore now. And, and here at JISC, we, we work both with teachers and with, with, uh, with library staff to try and make sure that that path is as seamless as possible. We're not there yet, probably but it's something that we're very much working on. And I think we have to do it together. We have to collaborate teachers and librarians together. We all want the same things, um, yeah, but those absolutely. professional I mean, divides need, need to maybe come down a little bit more. Yeah, you know, we're constantly being told to, to get out of our own silos in terms of our faculties and our departments and our schools and so on. Mm. But actually um, using that, the same metaphor with the service providers i think is, is, is really important you know and it, mm. a point you made to me is that libraries are not just service providers you know they are partners in education and certainly mm. in, in digital development and i think that's really really important and as mm -hmm. um as liz has just put in it, you know, the library has a major role around study skills and metacognition so thank you for all that you do and long may it continue um and that you know that um, partnership and, and thank you for bringing me into the conversation, Matt. Really appreciate it. Brilliant. No, it's great. Thank you very much indeed. Right, moving swiftly on again. Um, I'm not sure we've got. Uh, oh no, it's just we have. Of course, we have. Marin is up next um, to talk about uh, some of the things that were found in the last Alt survey uh, and some of the ideas that that comes from um, the Association of Learning Technology. Where learning technology fits into this? Obviously, it's it supported a huge amount of it. So um, I'm looking forward to this as well. Thank you, Matt, and hello, everybody. I'm so thrilled to be here with you, um, both of those of you looking forward to the book and also with my fellow authors and collaborators. Um, I wanted to start by just saying a huge thank you to Matt because I was so snowed under trying to support learning technologists through the crisis that this chapter would have not happened without Matt, who um, helped co-author the chapter and brought it all together. Um, so I just wanted to say a big thank you, Matt. And obviously, if you have anything that you wanted to add um, in terms of this particular piece of work, please do. Um, but the work is really based on findings from our annual survey and in particular during the pandemic period this survey has provided an opportunity for an independent voice to bring together lots of different perspectives about the impact of the pandemic on learning technology and i wanted to share some findings um, from the survey from this year um, and also give you some links to be able to download um, the findings from all years and the data which is openly available um, but just to give you a sense of the kind of data we were looking at for this chapter, which is really um, thinking about the vast increase in blended and hybrid models of learning, um, and also thinking about shifts in technologies and tools. Um, so I think in 2020, we saw a huge shift towards technologies and tools like Teams and Zoom, which were very readily available and implemented at huge scale. Now this year, we've seen a shift again, a little bit away from that to bring a more nuanced offering. Um, but we're also reflecting throughout the pandemic that student engagement has never really wavered as the number um, one drive for the use of learning technology. Just to give you a flavor of the kinds of data sets that we were looking at. Um, so this is a good example of um, the kind of data we were looking at in our chapter. So looking at, for example, enablers and drivers um, and looking at how um, 
these have changed throughout the pandemic. We have, I think, six years of comparative data now that we can draw on. And again, this is openly available if you want to have a bit of a um, deep dive into that yourself. So that was one of the things um, we looked at. We also looked at the technology, um, in particular, which technologies um, came to the forefront. And this slide shows you a comparison of 2020 against 2021, just to see um, how much, for example, teams um, in particular dominated everybody's experience of um, crisis provision learning technology. And one of the questions we asked as well is how learning technology professionals felt um, their colleagues, their wider colleagues within their institutions, perception of learning to enhance teaching changed in response to COVID-19. And for the past couple of years, there's been an overwhelming response, like over 80% each year um, of participants who said that they felt there was an increased positive perception of TEL. Now, I certainly want to acknowledge um, all the dark sides of the pandemic that we have started to you know, reflect on and that many of my co-authors have mentioned already today. But I also think there's been um, some positives that we can draw from, you know, particularly when it comes to learning technology itself. Now, I, here is the link and I'll put it in the chat as well if you want to explore the data sets that the chapter is based on. But again, a big thank you particularly to Matt who helped co-author this chapter. You're very welcome. It, 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 was, it was a really useful one to do some work on and to have before we had to kind of hand in the final proofs because it, it led me to some of the kind of major conclusions we used both at the opening part of the book about what where the book was going but also at the end and the key thing was that was slightly interesting it was slightly um intriguing i wasn't necessarily expecting it but i suppose it makes absolute sense that where you asked all of the um the learning technologists to sort of talk about what were going to be the most important things moving forward and nobody put mentimeter kahoot pollster padlet all of those kind of whiz bang flashy things that we all started using and oh have you seen this and everyone started it wasn't all those kind of new glittery things. It was simple tools for collaboration, whether synchronously or asynchronously, but things where students could work together and where students could work with their teacher, whether they're online or not. So it was much more, and as both several of the people in the chat have been mentioning, it's it's the collaboration. It's not just the teaching, it's the learning, you know, and I, I yeah, and I've, I've been told off before about that being a false dichotomy, but actually, you know, I always say, I'm not in a classroom to teach. I'm there to facilitate the learning of students. And rather than just having clever ways of getting it across, having useful ways for people to talk and to argue and to fight their own way to knowledge, that's literally what constructivism is, you know, which many of us will kind of cling to. So uh, I absolutely encourage you to have a look at that survey. It's eye opening and really interesting. So, uh, yeah, perfect. Thank you very much, Marilyn. That was great. And I really enjoyed writing with you as well. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Great. I don't think we have got Rachel from um, the, the kind of publishing side of things, because that, you know, that which again was interesting. So quite a short little vignette rather than an essay in the book, but again, it's really interesting. So I'm going to move on then to Sarah and Shoshi uh, from um, the Bloomsbury Learning Exchange to talk to us a little bit about the impact on them of COVID. I hope you're making jump on. Hey Matt, thanks so much for the invite. Um, this is a super exciting time for the Bloomsbury Learning Exchange, which is the cross-institutional organisation that I manage, direct, whatever you want to say, I am um, look after. Um, I am sat here on a sofa with a very poorly assistant, so um, apologies if you can hear horrible children's music in the background or want to know I'll see um, a little face there, but she's not feeling very well today. So um, I will be very brief and then I would like to hand over to Shoshi. So um, my experience of um, lockdown and the pandemic was actually that I was on, mater uh, on maternity leave looking after this small person who was a lot smaller at the time. So I came back to work in November 2020 to a completely changed world. My world was fairly changed anyway, but everybody else um, had been experiencing different things. And so the, the 
service that I run um, and manage, I'd left in the very capable hands of Julian Bream, who hopefully will be on this chat, if not right now, imminently. Um, it was not quite the uh, maternity cover role he had expected either. But the point of our service has always been about bringing people together, facilitating uh, the sharing of good practice, uh, and making sure that our colleagues, um, academics, learning technologists, staff development managers are all supported. Um, and that support kind of took a slightly different turn in the pandemic. So we brought people virtually together to make sure that they were um, not feeling too um, sort of uh, burdened. Of course they all were, but just giving them that space and opportunity to talk about um, the effect and the impact of lockdown working on them. Um, in order to put this chapter together for the book, we um, actually did a slightly different, um, we took a different approach. We were interviewed and Shoshi, who I'll hand over to in a sec, you might want to say a few words, interviewed us about our experiences, how our practice changed, what the impact was on, on our workload as well as how we were supporting others. And we brought in Shoshi as a friend of the Bloomsbury Learning Exchange, but someone who doesn't work for an institution that's a partner. So she's sort of like a critical friend who could give a kind of an overview view and, and sort of bring out um, findings and, and things that we couldn't see, you know, sometimes you can't see the, the forest for the trees. So Shoshi, I, I wonder if you wanted to say something at this point. Yes, sure. Just trying to reshare my, my video. Oh, no, that's going to show the back of the room, which isn't helpful. Um, apologies. Um, I, I was um, really excited when Sarah gave me, um, contacted me about taking part in, in documenting what the blue, what the blue had been through and what they achieved during the pandemic I thought um, it was as, as I've been mentioned before in fact that kind of effective reflective stage which people didn't have time to to really work on um, or, 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 or do much of especially at the start of the pandemic and what was evident was that this was not only an opportunity for those involved in the bleed to do this but it was also an opportunity for them to demonstrate how this had become such a part of their working model during the pandemic so um, the conversation in the book um, as you'll see moves from the technical support and that guidance to learn technologists and to member institutions into really support supporting staff to find their way to create a community of practice to create a community to offer coaching to help people feel like they weren't alone and they weren't the only ones dealing with these immense pressures and to provide a space and a time um, and in quite a positive story and Sarah can back me up here I think it's actually changed your approach going forward is that you actually are conti really continuing with this coaching model with making that a primary service that that you offer um, member institutions so it was just it was exciting to to see in the in the context of in one chapter that journey and also lovely to hear how how it fits in with what other people are saying as well around lessons learned from COVID changes of approaches especially when um, the believe works very much with learning te in the learning technology field so um, colleagues who often don't aren't necessarily included in those conversations because they're maybe seen as service providers um, and and they're and they're they're working maybe a bit a bit dissociated um, from from the students themselves, but having that space to reflect and to form the community. So that was um, a lovely experience. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you everyone else for enabling me to be a part of this project. Bro, and you're absolutely right. It's it suddenly shot people like that into the foreground, and we we you know we we need to acknowledge those partnerships more going forward. That you know they aren't service providers; they are real partners i think that's been certainly a real eye-opener for me so thank you for that what i liked about that was you know the, the obvious link to what's already been said about it's about facilitating good practices again it's collaboration it's exchange it's it's sharing the best it's not keeping it to ourselves and being oh well i'm you know we'll do that and then our competitors won't be able to and we'll be better it's, it's not about that it's about you know the most effective support for our students so that was really interesting and uh, you know in terms of just the book itself what was fascinating was the way the chapters came back they were all different and that that yours with the kind of series of um interviews was a really interesting one just for 10 seconds would you like either of you just to say a little bit about the dedication oh yes please thank you um 
So um, one of the founding partners of the Bloomsbury Learning Exchange was the marvellous Nicholas Short, Nick Short, who hopefully some of you will have worked with. He was um, a vet, a qualified vet, but he headed up the digital media unit, electronic media unit at the Royal Veterinary College. One of the brains behind the Bloomsbury Learning Exchange and he re took early retirement, but he, he re remained a, a big important figurehead in my life and continued to be a mentor. Um, he sadly passed away last year. Um, and he knew about the book chapter. He was looking forward to getting his hands on a draft and helping us shape it. And unfortunately, that never happened. So um, I, I asked John and Matt if it would be possible to, to, to dedicate a chapter. I know it's not a, usually a, a done thing for a chapter in a book, but I was really grateful to, to John and Matt who said yes immediately. So thank you to, for that. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Uh, absolutely. Right, brilliant. Um, Leaping forward, we've got a really interesting thing now from Rachel and Rob about uh, lecture capture. Um, so at Northampton particularly, but are you there? We are. Thank you very much, Matt. Excellent. Um, oh, just waiting for the slides to appear. I think it's been really interesting. Um, it, as I was listening to the earlier kind of presentations, I was thinking, well, how does our chapter fit in? But actually, the more that the conversation has gone on, the more it's become clear as to why this has been such a you know, useful thing for us to go through and hopefully a useful contribution to the book. And just picking up, you know, Bob was talking earlier about technology for learning and not just teaching and Caroline talking about connectedness and how, how do you add that value um, in face to face. And so hopefully as we go through this, that will give us some kind of, you know, we'll, we'll see how this connects together. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the situation around lecture capture at Northampton pre-pandemic and then how we responded during the pandemic. Um, and then Rob's gonna look at um, how we've adapted since. So have we learned some of those lessons, what we kept and what are those ongoing challenges that we kind of have to face as we think about the kind of new normal as we go on from here. So um, the collective capture policy at North Northampton was introduced at a time when the university was in the process of a large scale transformation of learning and teaching anyway. So we were in the process of shifting away from one way transmission of information unless that was clearly the most pedagogically appropriate approach. Where staff could add more value through focusing on the application um, of learning in face-to-face -face sessions, then it would be more appropriate for them to produce custom-made recordings and situate those as part of a wider asynchronous learning activity that students could engage with prior to the face-to-face -face interactive session. So the lecture capture policy was really about articulating that approach and making it clear that where you did have lecture style elements in your sessions and where that was appropriate, that only those purely transmission elements of the face-to-face -face session would be recorded. We also wanted to only record the staff voice, um, so that would help us to avoid that um, requirement to obtain and to manage the student consent, and also to just focus on audio recording only, although we did say that you know we should record slides where appropriate. But then we had COVID. Um, and during that pivot to emergency remote teaching at the start of the pandemic, it kind of short, saw a shift in the approach. And the university made this sort of strong recommendation um, at that point that all, um, all synchronous sessions would be recorded. Now, that, the idea behind that then was that we would have them available on the VLE for subsequent replay at any time and any place, anywhere kind of thing for our students. However, when we moved to that business recovery phase at the end of that first lockdown and the university began to start planning for that return to campus in September 20, the university agreed that it was important for us to think about return to that pre-COVID policy position. Uh, let's just go back a slide. That's it. Leave it on the on-air one. <laughs> that would be great. Um, it would be important to return to that pre-COVID policy position where recording was a decision for the staff to make based on pedagogic appropriateness, guided by student needs, and designed to maximise the pedagogic value of recordings to students, as well as to maximise the pedagogic value of the face to face sessions when staff were actually in a room, either virtually or physically with their students. And while we had this drive to enable staff to own and manage that recording process themselves and to share what worked, we still had a number of concerns. Um, I'm just going to hand over to Rob, who's going to sort of pick these up now with a more in depth look at what the current position is around lecture capture at Northampton. Thanks very much, Rach. So, um, so in terms of this chapter, I mean, as Matt said, it's slightly different because obviously it's looking at very much the the policy and the system uh, impact um, at the university. So, in terms of the the challenges that we had, we 
um, we'd moved to a dedicated space, um, essentially, or uh, sorry, moved to a dedicated campus, essentially, in, in Waterside, uh, right in the centre of Northampton. Um, and some of the people, um, obviously, during COVID, they didn't necessarily have those, those spaces to learn and study. So obviously, that by itself was a very much a, a challenge for those people. Um, as we know, a lot of people had problems with their internet access and generally devices to, to actually access. Luckily enough, uh, similar to, to what Bob was saying, we made some changes a few years ago where we gave um, all staff mobile devices and all students as part of the um, student promise. Actually, we, we give all incoming students a mobile device as well. So actually, some of our students were better equipped than we were finding at some of our uh, comparator uh, institutions. Uh, broadband obviously was still an issue, uh, but obviously we tried to help where we could do, but obviously that was quite difficult. Even though people had devices, didn't necessarily have um, the right level of digital literacy to actually engage. Um, and the actual move to remote learning itself, um, of most of us I think actually found it obviously had a, a real mental and physical health impact um, upon all the people that were involved in the process. Um, in terms of looking at our, our types of access, we were obviously looking quite widely. We support students across the, the world. Uh, and particular in China, uh, we put in some additional provision um, using uh, a connection called Alibaba to try and promote a, a better form of connection with those types of students. So uh, ideally trying to overcome some of the broadband uh, limitations that people actually have. So obviously had an impact on storage space and some of the associate costs because obviously people were starting to um, store things in a way that they hadn't previously. Uh, and so we noticed from a system perspective, quite a big increase there. In terms of where we are now, um, HyFlex is, is still around, although I think it's probably faded off from where people were, were looking at it previously. There's still a few tutors that will use it, but it's very selective actually, um, and they are recording some of the synchronous sessions where it's appropriate. Um, we've been looking at the retention period. Some of the academics actually really valued some of the sessions that had been recorded uh, during the times of COVID and they've actually wanted to retain those in our, our VLE for a little bit longer. We've had a look at the disproportionate burden uh, for checking captions as well because um, some of the academic staff, if we were working right to the, the full level of the, the WACAD regulations, um, they would have to human check the recordings to make sure that the captions are actually accurate. Um, and we actually uh, produced a disproportionate burden as part of that, um, which took some of the, the weight away. It didn't necessarily take away the, the accuracy because what we did was we said that students that need that would be taken down a, a slightly different path with a different team to support them in that process. But for the majority of tutors, it meant that that didn't them off uh, creating the, the lectures themselves. We looked at the working space <coughs> stability um, and you've got there the, the open booked and home office, um, looked at some of the, the tools for session engagement and also looked at the um, use of recorded sessions, particularly around research. Um, we hadn't used some of the, the tools previously uh, in a research capacity, but actually a lot of people found that during COVID, it was actually working better, some of the recording tools than they had done previously, just using personal dictaphones. So that was very much a, a change for us. But um, overall, it was, it was great to reflect on that in the in the chapter. Thanks, Matt. Thank you very much. And you know, one of the points of the book really is for people to see what was done and compare it to their own practices and praxis and to work out, you know, what you could use, what you could steal, magpie, what you could even offer as a solution to others. You know, so uh, it, it's really interesting to capture all these different elements that are going on. It's interesting that you were giving out mobile devices way beforehand. And there's actually a link to um, yeah. the, the the chapter done with uh, Trudy and others um, from from Leeds on supporting medical and ward based learning because they were doing that again I think from 2012 I think it was said you know, so quite a way before so there's some really interesting things there um, and I, I know we've kind of blasted over time on this one but I remember working with uh, David Cousins from Northampton a while back when we were writing that well I was writing a chapter with a colleague about flip learning and we used some of the these ideas about pre face to face and face to face so it's interesting to see that kind of continuing and being moved. So lovely, thank you very much for that. Um, next is uh, 
it's me and you've heard enough of me about initial teacher education and if anyone wants to pick that up we can do it perhaps in the q a because i'm conscious we need to move forward um truly is more is going to um pick up anything uh around medical based stuff again in the q a so coming towards the end now we've got uh, i think we've got carmen who's going to tell us about the impact on arden the private university yes great thank you um i'll just pop my camera on if you can see that okay yes but okay perfect it's another one who got their uh, doctorate during this journey so well done to you huh? <laughs> yeah so again a, you know big thank you because um john was uh supervising me at the time of this uh, chapter and Matt was being very patient because I was saying just a bit longer, just a bit longer because I'm just writing up the final the findings. So um, it was um, a very hectic time for me because I was writing about um, online learning, teaching practices, and have shifted it from blended to purely online just because that reflected the nature of what Arden did. So I basically changed my um, I guess the collection of data in the middle of um, the pandemic so um, it was a very busy time so thank you for the opportunity and for helping out Matt but you were really great over that period. So um, at the time then um, our chapter is focused on um, Arden's experience during the pandemic and um, much of what we um, planned really in our chapter was based on the evaluation of the first wave of the lockdown so we were looking at how we could use the experiences from the first wave and be a bit more proactive and I guess less reactive in the second wave. So we focused on September to December um, of um, that, that first year of the pandemic. And we at that time we had a project team that came together to help us. One thing we did learn is it was very much hands on deck in the first wave. And we wanted to have more of a, um, a collaborative approach from different departments. So I think one of our kind of key learnings here was um, about we, we talk about trust and about how we responded to lots of unforeseen events and the challenges of working, I guess, across different natures of working, which is explored a bit there about in the chapter about um, the makeup, I think, of some IT colleagues and um, and maybe some more of a project management style as some colleagues and then the academic discursive style so how we kind of navigated uh, the different cultures and habitats so we, we um, have, have got some of that in the chapter as well so one of the, one of the things that we're doing so just to just to very briefly tell you about what we tried to do we were looking at um, a project called your degree your way which was um, aimed to give students uh, flexibility and choice of when they attended, uh, not when, how they attended the session. So we ran our timetabled sessions as normal throughout the pandemic. And there were four hour sessions for blended learning students. So they were the same timetabled sessions. And in some ways we had a different experience to other traditional universities in that um, we, had, we came from a distance learning um, perspective. So we had modules and fully built out modules that our blended learning students had. So within our experience, we brought to the surface really kind of challenging questions about well, what is the nature of our blended learning? and Why are we using the materials in this way? And I think we were really keen as a group to be pedagogically led and learn from the unique contextual factors of our students. So many of our students um, were carers, many of them um, were working in healthcare. We had a lot of um, first generation learners and Arden at the time was growing at 60%, um, both students and staff. So we had a high turnover, in term, high intake of new staff. So we were really focused on how we could use professional development to help coach and mentor staff and then look at the unique opportunities of how we could learn from our students and how our staff went through the pandemic and we captured a lot about pedagogical practice and how we could be more inclusive. So that was um, really our kind of journey. We, we've summarised it. Um, it was definitely a catalyst for lots of conversation. Um, we learned a lot about blended 
and we we thought we knew quite a lot about blended but we learned more i think ironically from our face-to-face -face students uh, about the blended and the online kind of um, learning aspects and our staff base um, although we had a history of distance learning, our, our lecturers were those who had been used to face-to-face. -face. So we found that we had less of a division between distance learning lecturers and students and blended and that kind of um, distinction between the both felt much more closer together, which is Arden's position now and much more of a join up between our distance learning provision and uh, blended learning. Okay, so I think that's if, if there's any questions there, Matt. That or comments. Really interesting, thank you. Um, and it's interesting that you kind of picked on what did you learn from the first wave to get ready for the second mm -hmm. wave, if you know, and, and how much of that was, was kind of doable. And you mm -hmm. know, coming from a not everyone's distance learning, I guess, but for though the majority that are, you were already kind of set up. Whereas mm -hmm. what I think we tried to do was to replicate our timetable. To, but doing it online and that was really tricky you know we really uh, and, and we did that sorry we did that so for our blended students we did that but we didn't necessarily have the lecturers who we uh, supporting students we have seven uh, campuses so um, students who were being supported in the campuses um, were being uh, obviously supported face to face and probably hadn't used the online materials as much as what other um you know other students have done so there's a perception i think that they were blended <laughs> of course we had to really think about what's the best use of the online the face-to-face -face, the materials and then we allowed students to switch between modes so to come into campus you know when they could and, and to switch between that okay we 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 moved down to a this, this bubble method of very small groups once each so we guaranteed our students would have some time on campus if they wished for it but there were others that could um could be solely online so it was it was interesting really it, you know it was a real mm -hmm. kind of mismatch um so thank you for that that was really interesting okay. oh, brilliant. Yeah, thank um you. my final speaker was planned to be professor diana Lorelord, but i think she's had to go i know for a fact she's on granny duty um with um a very little one and so she says she's, she's dropping in and out so my key point i think that i've picked up from everybody has been just how important collaboration is. Collaboration between uh, between members of staff, between staff and service providers, between learning technologists and librarians, and between publishing houses and each other, relying on staff teams, and also, of course, crucially, that collaboration with students and that that idea about facilitating learning and not just educating, not just teaching. So there's a whole load in there that was really interesting and that is drawn out in the book you know the, the we are heading towards well we thought we might be heading towards this new normal as we really kind of um you know move to it sorry i've just got a message from diana she just can't deal with the little one which is fair enough 10 months old um so it's had to drop out we you know the, we have all these ideas we're moving towards this new hybrid high flex uh, blended approach where we're going to be able to use and actually a lot of places a lot of people are reporting already that we're kind of sliding back into the old normal and we know that we've removed face masks you know and, and that the pandemic is over um and it, it's really interesting to see what have we kept what have we kept hold of what what has been important to us and what have we managed to ditch as soon as we could right uh, what i'm going to do then is i'm going to throw it open to those participants who have very patiently sat through all of that uh, hopefully you've enjoyed it and found it interesting and useful um but there are at least 17 people who have hung around so hopefully they've got questions to ask so marin what's probably the best way of doing this hands up or write in the chat or both um, I'm just on it. Um, so I think everybody who is a participant should now also have a mic. Um, I've enabled that. So um, hopefully you should see a mic button appear. Um, so I, I hope that we can just um, have someone raise their hand. Um, I'm going to just demo that. So this is what raising hand looks like. And then Matt, hopefully you can um, call on individuals um, as we get questions. Is that okay? Yep, that'd be great. Okay.
So just to clarify, Matt, is it free for all? Are there any specific questions? Um, is no, people can either pick on, you know, they can ask, they can ask me, they can ask a specific person, they can ask a specific question, or they can just, or just generally, you know, raise your hand and say if, if, if you did something different or if you've taken something from this, and all we did, you know, ours was radically different or, or, or very similar. Anything at all would be just interesting just to add to that, um, that conversation. Liz. Awesome. Um, yeah, so my question is that now that things are supposedly getting back to normal, um, there seems to be a rhetoric in the media and the wider public that, you know, um, things should get back to just being face to face. And I just wondered, what are people doing within their institutions to um, extol the benefits of the blended learning approach and, and really educate the people about the fact that you know teaching and learning doesn't just have to be face to face it's it's much more um you know a holistic and it should be a much more holistic experience than than what just happens in an hour in a classroom i don't know about trying to educate people i know our university like many others has gone back to as much on in on campus as possible um there is some still some elements of the lecture capture and uh having things available I what we've I don't know whether it's a you know a classical phrase that everyone's using but we we're trying to keep hold of what we're calling covid keepers so things that were forced on us and um actually have become really useful and one that, that's crucial for me is the, the idea of online tutorials because you know if you're doing a raft of say master's tutorials or doctoral supervisions or um or even undergrad year one tutorials, but you've got to get through 20, 25 in a day. Everyone's coming in. They might be driving 30 miles in on their commute to come and speak to me for 15 minutes, which is just a giant waste of time. So having online tutorials, I think has really freed up space and time for people to, to get on with their, their work and their life and then have those important discussions. So I will never go back unless someone specifically requests it to on-site in office tutorials. And, this, and the other thing that's opened up for, for me particularly as a teacher trainer, obviously I have lots of students in schools, the ability now to talk to mentors by just jumping on teams rather than having to go in, you know, you'd book these visits months ahead. Now if there's a problem, you can just jump on teams. That has become really, really useful. And I think, so there are these COVID keepers that we're, that we're definitely latching onto, but I think very easily we are slipping back into our, everyone's on site as always, but there's an interesting, I saw something just float past then about using the VLE for exams. Um, ours is uh, are mainly um, on the VLE. We only have exams in year one, but yes, they all now are uh, online rather than in a room. I don't know what anybody else thinks, any other um, moderators or presenters. Rob. Yeah, so probably in terms of where we are, um, the, I think the JISC Insight survey has been really useful in terms of seeing um, what our students actually require uh, moving forward. And actually what's interesting for us, because we've been tracking this over the past five years, uh, is that big increase, I think, in the number of students who are now looking for more flexibility uh, in their work generally. Um, and the reasons are all the reasons that we've heard already. You know, it's about balance. It's around, um, like you said, not necessarily having to, to drive in for a, a one hour session and they're driving for at least two to three hours, perhaps to, to just go in for that, that one session. It's not necessarily their feeling the, the best use of their, their day. We're trying to, um, we're still trying to look at what makes a sticky campus or what, what the students want when they actually come onto campus and making sure that they actually have value when they're on there. But I think we're looking harder now at um, what uh, are the reasons why we do require a student to come on site and when is it appropriate actually when they can be um, sort of more remote. Um, and then just engage with us uh, at a distance. And obviously, um, there's been a big increase in the digital capability of both the, the staff and students um, that's been sort of scaled up. So we're, I think people are actually making advantage or taking advantage uh, from that as well. Thank you. And Liz has just put, popped in this, or Liz rather, has put some stuff in there from, from JISC around exactly that, how students feel. And I think that's 
I know Elliot couldn't be here, but that, that's a really important thing in all of this. You know, we can't lose the student voice. We can't pander to everything they need because you just can't. But where things can be recorded and can be posted up so that people can access it asynchronously and can engage. I mean, I'm involved in a, in a European wide project around co-creative courseware when we're looking specifically to have platform I, I, we've built a platform rather it's not that dissimilar to google docs i suppose but where people can go on read um they can leave a comment they can they can question each other they can answer and then you can put all that in a flipped approach up front and then the teacher can go on and see all that collaboration all that work and those kind of key questions and then build their session off the back of it so getting that student voice is absolutely vital um, and having some of those approaches like putting stuff up early and the pre face to face doing the session and then maybe even having a, a post face to face where they kind of go back and reflect on it and think and you know the old traditional homework style of things I think that those three part model you know, you know, there are issues with the post because lots of students don't want to do it because the pre session gets validated when you say oh brilliant I love the way you've said that the in class of course is validation because you're taking part the post no one sees so there is an interesting element to that but lots of stuff going on now fiona this mix of teaching online and in class that's a massive challenge i absolutely agree um i've tried it by having my laptop open and recording and so it's been it's not streamed it's been recorded by panops or whatever so the, it's linked to the um Link to the whiteboard, so it, it 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 changes as I speak. You know, as I move it forward, the and, and students can then go back and say, "I really like that slide. I want to read that again." So they click into that slide and they get that bit of speech. But it's really tricky for me because I'm one of those teachers that prances up and down and walks around the classroom. And it, as soon as you get anywhere distance from your laptop, you can't hear. But I, what I haven't tried really is streaming, and in class at the same time because it's so hard. I mean, Oh, sorry, I, I missed you there. Yeah, so just wanted to add in there that um, as part of our project, we invested in kit. So we had cameras that followed lecturers around the room. And then we did have to think really carefully about how do you present to students at home and students in the class? How do you use things like whiteboards? How do you do student centred learning when you're streaming um, and you've got students in two different spaces? So yeah, we had like movable cameras. That was kind of one way that we dealt with the issue Matt, of um, not having to be chained to the laptop. Interesting. I mean, we've done the same ever since we moved to the online team meetings, staff team meetings and phase meetings. We've never yet, I don't think, had a, a meeting since where we've all been in the room. We've always had several people zooming in, teamsing in, whatever, you know, whilst they're traveling and then you've got to, do you either have their enormous face looming at you from the whiteboard over there or do you have a couple of laptops and then you've got to try and make sure they're not squealing to each other so everyone's got to have them so it can be quite tri um, tricky but a uh, webcam in the middle of the room do you know i was i was at a this conference i was just or at least that project i was talking about the pan-european one we were at leuven in belgium last week and they had this amazing thing it looked like a kettle more than anything else about about yay high about a foot and a half high uh, a kind of dome shaped and it had sort of six cameras around the top so it was a giant microphone with cameras in every direction so when you saw it on screen you could see everybody sitting around the table at the same time and those who were online it was quite expensive it was at least a grand but it was uh, a really interesting piece of kit and then something else they had which i loved was a giant fluff ball you know remember the dice that you were able to i don't know if you, you're not all primary teachers of course like i am um we used to have a great big fluffy dice you could throw around the classroom and get kids to answer they had exactly the same thing it was again about i don't know 10 inches high and um in the middle of it was a microphone so you could throw it around the room and it was all fluffy and wouldn't get broken but when you got to the person they could then speak and it would come through the speakers so lots of really interesting bits of kit out there but again expensive Jed has been brilliant today. I meant to say earlier, thank you for adding those things from uh, for Bob's section and other bits. But there's another one, 360 degree cameras. It's one way of doing it, providing you've got uh, any funds left. And if you're anything like us, the answer is no. Um, fab. Um, let me just see what this bit says. Um, yeah, 
if that was which point. Um, thanks for that comment, Rob. That's really uh, helpful. And yeah, there has been some really interesting and in, uh, points raised. And again, they're in the um, all these, well, most of these points are brought out in the book. And um, if you go back up through the the chat, people who are just joining, you will find. Um, a link to both whether you can get the book and the code to get 50% off the book. So do have a look at that. Um, yeah, and also, Rich, you know, it's not just walking about is it, it's part of my teaching style. It's also that classical teacher thing of knowing where to go and stand and who to stand near to make sure they're actually getting on with it or to go and support those who are struggling or to go and draw on that group who are really working hard. If you're stood at the front tied to a microphone, that is much harder. So um, yeah, it, I, we're not offering absolute solutions here, but certainly suggestions for for ideas. Uh, any other points and questions? I know some people have only just joined, so um, that's a good point, actually, Marin. How will people be able to get hold of the recording? Thanks, Matt. So we will be sending out the recording from everyone registered to the webinar um, within the next couple of days, and we'll also make it available via the ALP website. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. So yes, if you if you have only just joined or you missed a bit or you dropped out or whatever, um, it will be available. So that's good. Um, so yes, um, before we wrap it up slightly early, are there any other questions or points? No. So it just remains me to say thank you very much for everyone that's come. Uh, I hope you found it useful, enlightening, interesting. Um, obviously, the book has a lot more of this kind of stuff. So go and have a look. Talk to your librarians maybe about getting a copy. Um, if you have colleagues that are teaching on uh, research or masters or undergrad um, digital things, then there is a whole load of, of stuff in there that you may find useful and they might find useful to have on their reading lists. I'd like to say thank you to Alt for uh, setting this up, to uh, Marin for, for kind of running it for us, to Elgar, obviously, who um, published it and approached us about the possibility of the book, and to every speaker. Thanks ever so much to all of you. Hope you found it great. Uh, I've really enjoyed that. Uh, it's my first ever book, so I'm really excited when it comes out. And, uh, and there you go, Let's absolutely put it on a reading list, make sure that every student not has to read it, that's not fair, but uh, definitely worth having a look at. Thank you very much indeed, everybody, and um, hope to see you at a conference or an online event sometime soon.